Transformers, Robots in Disguise, Bert, one of the Muppets from Sesame Street. Attention, what you're told to pay in school so that you don't get in trouble. At least that's what those words mean to the average person on the street, but for people working in neural machine translation, they have a completely different meaning. Hi, my name is John Tinsley, and this is the second uh, of a two-part video on neural machine translation, where we look at uh, how the technology has evolved to where it is today. If you haven't seen the first video, I recommend you check it out so you have a little bit of context uh, with this video um, because in this video we're going to get into the weeds a little bit more about uh, the state of neural MT research and what people have been working on, where the research directions are going uh, and what's still to do. So uh, when Neural MT started, it was really promising, but there were still uh, a lot of open research questions uh, that were posed by leading researchers in the field. Uh, and this was something covered in our blog in a lot of detail, which you can see on the screen here and you can refer to uh, if you need to. And these boil down to some basic practical questions, which we could consider to be some bugs that needed to be addressed before neural machine translation was ready to be released uh, into the wild. Some of these things were things that had been solved before in statistical MT, such as the ability to use customer specific terminology, the ability to handle tags, the ability to process certain named entities like URLs and email addresses. But then there were also a number of new issues introduced in neural machine translation, um, such as uh, kind of unpredictable translations or missing translations, incomplete translations and, and challenges dealing with them um, out of vocabulary words and, and adapting to different domains. Um, so step one uh, before NeuralMT could be used in practice was really to improve the robustness of this. Um, this is easier said than done and it was really um, the, the charge was led by companies who were working with MT in practice uh, in the coalface, including ourselves at Iconic. And we actually published a paper on, um, on how we did some of these uh, tasks to improve the robustness of, of neural machine translation. And there are really kind of three key things that I want to focus on here briefly. The first is data cleaning. So the data that we use to train machine translation engines is, is our gold. Um, but it needs to be very clean. So there can't be noise in the data in terms of misalignments or encoding issues or things like that because NeuralMT is very sensitive. So before we start training, we really need to clean the data because it's really a case of less is more uh, when it comes to training data. Uh, the second point is something called constrained decoding. This is basically the ability to be able to handle things in a specific way, i.e. translate terms in a certain way or not translate certain things that shouldn't be translated. This is critical in practice because for clients, terminology is sacrosanct and they really want to make sure that their style guides and their brands are adhered to. So it's really important that we're actually able to do this in your own machine translation. Uh, and the third is something we call byte pair encoding. This is to do with handling out of vocabulary words or words we don't know how to translate because by default in neural MT it will just leave them out in the translation but obviously we can't do that in practice so what byte pair encoding or BPE does is it breaks those unknown words down to maybe a sub word level or a character level translates those pieces and recombines it in the translation and this works very very well for out of vocabulary terms particularly for um, Asian languages so what this did is it got things over the line in terms of production uh, and then the research continued uh, fast at, at a much faster pace um, than ever before with record number of, of papers being published and actually uh, around this time we started to write a weekly blog on, on our website called the Neural MT Weekly where was, the idea was we would address a new research topic every week and that's been going for well over a year at this stage which kind of shows you how, how, how much new work is, is kind of constantly being done. Um, so what are some of the key things that researchers have been working on? I mentioned this word earlier on, uh, attention. Um, so even within the short lifespan of neural MT, we've had concurrent neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and attention-based models are now by far the state of the art. And, and what this means is basically looking at more context, looking at more words in the source so that we produce more contextualized, more accurate translations. And you might know this under a, a different name, which is used commonly, so-called transformer models. And um, this is a big step, and like I said, it's by now, uh, by far, the, the state of the art. Um, Another big area of research is uh, BERT. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's not uh, the Muppet from Sesame Street. In fact, it, it stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. And essentially, these are language models. So in statistical MT, language models were really key to improving the fluency of the output. And BERT is the attempt to essentially reincorporate this idea into neural MT. 
Incremental training is another uh, important concept. So with Neural MT, we train our models in stages or epochs. And with incremental training, we can actually restart the training process at any one of these epochs. So what this might mean is maybe we train 20 epochs with general data, and then after this, we introduce customer-specific data, and that allows us to influence the training of the model from that point on, more specifically to a particular customer. And that has a really good uh, ability to adapt the content for that particular user and their, uh, and their content and style. Lastly, dynamic adaptation is now a big new concept, and this is the idea for that each sentence that we're translating we retune the models of the neural MT system uh, to, to make it more suited to translate that segment. We translate it and then we reset the models again and do that, repeat that for each new sentence so that for each sentence we're translating, we get a more, uh, more fine-tuned translation. So where to next? Um, there's always been a lot of prophesizing about the direction of machine translation and what's going to happen by when. Um, I'd rather talk a little bit about where the research is focused now. Um, and I'm aware that this is the one part of the video that could age badly. So please only refer back to this video if I'm accurate in some of my uh, predictions. But a big area of focus is on what we call low resource languages. Uh, data is critical for machine translation, but we don't have as much data as we would like for many, many languages uh, around the world. So a lot of the research here is focused on how we can leverage data for other languages uh, in order to use that for new languages. So perhaps if we don't have a lot of, let's say, English to Swahili data, but we have a lot of English to Spanish data and some Spanish Swahili data, we could actually build what's called a multilingual machine translation system that can translate between multiple different languages at the same time. Uh, and another idea along these lines is what we call unsupervised training, which is where we start off with quite a small amount of training data and use that to train an engine, translate content, generate more synthetic data, and basically iterate that process until we get a final translation system um, that is more robust, but from a very kind of low starting point in terms of data. A second interesting topic is document level context. So at the moment, systems translate sentences individually with no other context, but document level basically says for any given sentence we're translating, let's look at all the sentences before, let's look at the sentences after, and use what we might learn from that in order to produce a more contextualized uh, translation. Lastly, one big topic that's on a lot of researchers' lips is quality estimation. And this is the idea that um, the machine translation system might give you some sense of how confident it is in terms of the output that it has just produced, some sort of quality score. And as you can imagine, this notion is really attractive to, to users of machine translation who might have some sense uh, as to how good the, the quality they're dealing with is. So I would say make sure to keep an eye on that research topic over the next 12 um, to 18 months. But for now, that's it for this uh, overview of neural machine translation. Um, if you haven't seen the first part of this video, I recommend you go back and check it out because they, they go well, quite well with each other. And definitely continue to stay tuned to this series where some of my colleagues will talk about how neural MT is actually being applied uh, in the wild. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and for watching. Thank you.